Our last talk for the second session is by Dr. Eric Monti again, uh, Associate Professor of Biology and Director of the Marine Sensory and Neurobiology Lab at USCV, and he's going to talk to us about underwater soundscapes. Okay. Thanks again uh, for inviting me to give this talk. This is very dear to me. Uh, we've done a lot of work over the last 10 years, and um, we've been fortunate now to have this uh, Estrin Soundscape Observatory Network in the Southeast, or ESONS, funded uh, by NOAA's Integrated Ocean Observing System um, through a subaward from Socorro for the next five years. So we're, we're, we're very, very happy about this. And this work has been done by a lot of colleagues and and uh, co-authors and a bunch of different individuals that I'll give acknowledgments at the end of the talk. So soundscapes are, are what we call a new approach for marine observatories. And sources of sound in estuaries and marine environments include biological sound, geophysical sound associated with wind, rain, waves, and human-generated sound or anthropogenic sound associated with ships, recreational vessels, uh, container ships, pile driving, seismic air guns, um, other sources of noise like wind turbines associated with wind. But one of the cool things about soundscapes is that we find out that many aquatic organisms actually produce sound, everything from snapping shrimp to fish to dolphins. And so we can eavesdrop on animal behavior at multiple levels of biological complexity. And that's useful in estuaries where visibility is limited, where most of the time, you, in the, especially in the summertime, you, can only, you, you, you can't see more than six inches. And one cool thing about this technology, it allows very high temporal resolution. And what I mean by that is that you can sample very frequently. So for, exa for example, you could sample the underwater soundscape you know, for two minutes every hour. Over here is an instrument of one of our recorders illustrating the hydrophone, the, um, the battery pack mounted in an instrument frame with water temperature and depth sensors. You can put other sensors as well if you have the funding. So an estuary's health is measured by both the diversity of marine life. As Elizabeth mentioned in her talk, as well as the abundance of species. So if we look at this very elementary food chain on the left, where we have phytoplankton species, they're indicative of primary producers, zooplankton, primary consumer, consumers, you know, planktivore fish and marsh fish, secondary consumers, and spotted sea trout, red drum as tertiary consumers, and you know, bottlenose dolphins as quaternary consumers. This is a healthy food chain. And it's a lot more complex than this in probably the Port Royal Sound area. In fact, I know it is, but um, it's a that's a whole nother topic. But by listening, we can tap into key behaviors of different trophic levels and estuarine ecosystems through really remote sensing behavior at a high temporal resolution. For example, snapping shrimp is a good example of a organism on this smaller end of food chains, uh, snapping shrimp produce snaps as part of their foraging ecology to stun prey. We'll learn that uh, spot silver perch, black drum, oyster toadfish, spotted sea trout, and red drum all produce calls and choruses associated with spawning. And finally, bottomless dolphins, they, can, they echolocate for foraging, produce whistles, for communication and burst pulses during the mating process. Current scientific studies are actually leaning towards a paradigm that healthy estuaries are actually loud estuaries. And the healthier the estuary is, the louder it is biologically. That does not take into consideration the noise generated by humans. 
So long-term monitoring using underwater recorders may provide an efficient way to track changes in the health of an estuary. So let's talk about the May River. That's our longest soundscape data set. It actually goes back nine years. We started in 2012 with short-term acoustic recordings at 27 stations throughout the May River, all the way from the headwaters to the mouth. And we published that work in the Transaction American Fisheries Society. In 2013 and 14, we, had, we started uh, deploying these recorder setups at six stations, all the way from the headwaters to the mouth, where we recorded sound for two minutes every 20 minutes with temperature and depth loggers. We didn't record during the winter time during that time period. And then in 2015, we dropped the number of stations down to 9M, 14M, and 37M. And we began to record sound year round at two minutes every hour. So we published a ton we, uh, over the last 10 years um, with soundscapes. We investigated with uh, work with collaborative work with DNR, how acoustic monitoring indicates a correlation between calling and spawning and captive spotted sea trout and red drums. So calling of fish is, is correlated with reproduction. We, we determined uh, uh, baseline estimates for fish calling, which helps with the reproductive timelines, timelines in the May River estuary. We did work, then we shifted more towards soundscape work where we looked at the entire food chain everywhere from snapping shrimp to fish to dolphins. Uh, then we started to do some sound characterization and fine scale spatial mapping of estuarine soundscape and showed that certain habitats you know, had pockets of sound and had this really neat uh, spatial distribution of sound in different areas of estuaries. Then we started to link soundscapes to phenology and biodiversity in estuaries and then some long-term work with uh, bottles, bottlenose dolphin acoustics, which Alyssa Marion will review in, in a talk later on this afternoon. So what have we learned over the last 10 years studying estuarine soundscapes in the Port Royal Sound area? The major contributors to an estuarine soundscape include snapping shrimp, fish, oyster toadfish, black drum, Atlantic croaker, silver perch, spotted sea trout, red drum, and of course, bottlenose dolphins, including echolocation, first pulses and whistles, as well as vessel noise. Now remember, black drum, croaker, silver perch, spotted sea trout, red drum, all are all in the family cyanidae. They're called drums because they produce sound and that's very important in fish reproduction. Another very important part of this work that we've discuss discovered are natural rhythms of biological sound. And these rhythms follow seasonal, lunar, day, night, and tidal cycles. In fact, for example, lower tides, we actually see, we actually hear more snapping shrimp, as well as more dolphins. Fish reproduction, as I stated, strong correlations between fish calling and spawning and captivity as well as fish calling and young of the year abundance in the wild for silver perch, spotted sea trout, and red drum. Bottlenose dolphins, we've learned a ton of about bottlenose dolphin vocalizations. And one of the big findings is that vocalizations are actually more prevalent in the winter time compared to the summer, despite an influx of migrants in the summer and this might be due to less prey in the winter, which may indicate that dolphins have to echolocate more to find food. Now, Alyssa Marion will talk more about this in the afternoon session. Biodiversity. We, we actually see a strong relationship spatially and temporally between biological sound levels and biodiversity. In fact, years with you know, what we showed actually that the transition between winter and spring 
which is a dynamic time period with an increase, we actually see an increase in biological sound during the springtime. And that mirrors the increase in phytoplankton, zooplankton, invertebrate, and fish abundance that drive changes in primary, secondary, and tertiary productivity within estuaries. Phenology. So we actually see an increase in acoustic activity of snapping shrimp in certain fish species, and it occurs earlier in years with warmer springs. So this is a great way to track climate variability and climate change and how those processes might affect reproduction. So I'm gonna just go and tell a little more about this one story about fish reproduction. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to look at how cyan cyanid courtship sounds, you know, red, silver perch, red drum, and uh, silver perch, spotted sea trout, and red drum correlate with juvenile appearance and abundance in the May River, South Carolina. So we wanted to examine the patterns of fish calling in the May R River estuary over a six time, a six year time frame from 2013 to 2018, determine how environmental factors influence fish acoustic activity, and then invest, investigate the correlation between fish calling and young of the year appearance and abundance from 2016 to 2018. And so here are our recorders and here are the, our seining sites, which I'll talk about in our next slide. And we also wanted to examine the phenology of fish calling and yoy appearance. So back again, these are our long-term record recorders at 9M, 14M, and 37M. And these are our seining stations that we seined uh, a, a few times a month along in these areas of acoustic stations. So here's our longer term studies in the, in the May River estuary and how it reveals year to year patterns of fish calling. So let me guide you through this figure because it's a complex one. So here's 2013 and here's 2018. And this is our water temperature from our hobo loggers in red. And then in brown here is the, the daylight hours. And this, these two variables are very important in uh, they're very two very important factors in the reproductive season of cyanids, and we'll, we'll we'll show this in just a second. So all these blue little areas here is essentially what we do is we sum the calling intensity per acoustic file that we obtain from our recorders. So we give it a score of zero, one, two, or three, where zero is no calling, one is one call, two is more than one call, multiple calls, and three is chorusing, where we can't differentiate the actual fish calls because they're overlapping and forming a chorus. So when we add those up per evening, we plot those over a long term time frame. And what you can see here is black drum chorusing. And so black drum chorusing tends to occur in the early springtime. Then we we see silver perch scoring, and each one of these is really giving you the spawning potential for of this species. So silver perch here is in green, and you can see every year um, we get a, a big chorusing of, of silver perch. And here we just had an issue with our recorder, so we we were not unable to re, to uh, acquire acoustic data in the in the spring of 2017. That happens sometimes with long-term sensors. This is spotted sea trout. Uh, this is the chorusing season for spotted sea trout, which is finely tuned to the lunar cycle, which is we, we could discuss in a whole different paper. And then finally, red drum in the fall time. And all of these chorusing timelines actually correlate well with what's been previously found in cyanids. So if we look at, so again, when 37 is at the mouth of the May River, and actually 
if we start, if we look at 9M and 14M, so 9M is more towards Palmetto Bluff, 14M is more towards um, the Oyster Factory, we can see these similar patterns here um, from for black drum, silver perch, spotted sea trout, and red drum. I'd like to point out that red drum, we only detect chorusing of red drum actually at the mouth of the May River where it's about 70, 80, 70 feet deep. So we think that's the only location that red drum are actually having uh, forming spawning aggregations in the May River. So our saning program design, we saned from 2016 to 2018. We sained six to two, 12 tidal pools, creeks, or shoreline habitats monthly on the low tide. We selected randomly these, these sites randomly from a pool of 50 sites near our listening stations from all the way from the headwaters all the way to the mouth. Monthly water salinity, dissolved oxygen, and pH was also uh, uh, taken. And we reported, uh, in addition, we also reported, uh, we reported species abundance per meter squared of the seine and lengths. The one thing I wanted to point out is that 4M, 19M, and 34M, those were uh, recorders that were um, provided uh, in 2013 and 14. So we didn't include those here. So correlation between fish calling and young of the year appearance. So, um, as you can see, it was complicated to identify young of the year in our sayings, but we had Bill Rumelet, um, a past em employer, a past, past employee of South Carolina DNR, help us with identification of silver perch, spotted sea trout, and red drum, because we're talking about very small fish. It's sometimes 15 to 20 millimeters in length. And so here's our um, silver perch, spotted sea trout, and red drum. And again, 2016 to 2018. And what we want to show here is this is our temperature profile in red. And in, for silver perch, you can see the spawning, uh, actually the sum of a calling intensity here of the two different stations, 9 and 4M, overlapped on top of each other. And then what we see just shortly after that is the abundance of silver perch about a month after when we first start hearing the males chorusing. So we see a good, remember we're, we're saying all year round and we're not getting any silver perch except shortly after we detect uh, chorusing of silver perch. Spotted sea trout, a slightly different pattern because spotted sea trout uh, chorus all summer long because they they're uh, they're they're extended spawners or protracted they have a protracted spawning season, and we begin to see uh, spotted sea trout uh, appearing in our uh, young of the year appearing in our sains about roughly about one one month after we start to detect chorusing, and finally red drum in the fall we begin to detect red drum young of the year in the fall um, about one month after we we start to hear male red drum chorusing. And this is just at station 37M. So it, uh, chorusing, there's a strong correlation between fish calling and the young of the year appearance. Now, what about abundance? So we actually looked at abundance. And so I'm gonna uh, look at, follow again, silver perch, spotted sea trout and red drum for the three different years. And the percent hours of calling that they've, called out of the files that we, we monitored. You can see here, uh, that's in this black line here, 2016, 17, and 18. And what follows is the mean abundance. And then we have temperature. So in the years in which silver perch males called longer, we actually detected more silver perch in our sains. And that correlated nice, correlated with a warmer springtime. For spotted sea trout, we saw a similar pattern in 2016, 17, and 18. In 2016, we actually detected the, the, hot, the most amount of calling and the least in 2018. 
And the abundance in our sayings followed that pattern. And what was very interesting is that 2018 was a very, very cold year. Okay. And so that was an interesting finding. Now, red drum, red drum tend to chorus in the fall time. And what we ended up seeing is that uh, there was more calling in 2018. It was a cooler uh, fall. And we saw, we, we detected more hours of chorusing of red drum, and we detected more red drum in our sayings, which followed a cooler pattern, which is expected. So conclusions, fish acoustic activity is a seasonal event influenced by location, water temperature, seasonal daylight, as well as lunar, day, night, and tidal cycles. In years with warmer spring temperatures, we detected silver perch and spotted sea trout chorusing earlier than in years with cooler spring water temperatures. Now, I didn't show these data. It's kind of complex. So I, um, you can read the paper where it's in the process of responding to reviewers in, in Marine Ecology Progress Series. Um, we also found positive correlation between the hours of calling and the young of year abundance. So where are we headed? Well, as I stated, uh, NOAA's Integrated Ocean Observing System is funding our work through a sub-award from Socorro. And we founded the Estrin Soundscape Observatory Network in the Southeast. So we monitor the sounds of four estuaries in South Carolina using our long-term passive acoustic recorders. Um, I can play a couple sounds here if you'd like. Uh, this is what a snapping shrimp sounds like. For those of you who don't know what snapping shrimp sound like, they sound like Rice Krispies. Here's a, a chorus of silver perch. Can you hear that okay? And here's a chorus of spotted sea trout. Here's a a chorus of red drum at the mouth of the May River, lower frequency. Here are dolphins, those are burst pulses. And some American alligators right here. And the Great Salt Pond, I believe. So one of the things, I've got a few more slides here. Our, our soundscape network overlaps in, uh, in space with fishery independent surveys and bottomless dolphin surveys. So here's, a, th this was provided by Dr. Ballinger's lab. And so we, we monitor uh, sound in the May River. We monitor sound in Chichesse Creek, Colleton River in the Port Royal Sound area as well as Charleston Harbor and North Inlet Winyu Bay National Estuarine Research Reserve. Um, and one neat thing is that it overlaps with South Carolina Department of Natural Resource Surveys, such as the Estuarine Trawl Survey, which Michael Kendrick um, manages, as well as the Electrofishing Trammel Net and Longline Survey. So we hope to correlate our soundscapes with diversity indices, as well as uh, individual abundances of, of sound producers. So some next steps are including uh, understanding climate variability and how it affects courtship call calls, which may, how that affects reproduction and, and potentially year class strength. So we have three neat species to, to follow this. Silver perch, a spring spawner, spotted sea trout, a summer spawner, and red drum, a fall spawner. So we can use the acoustic data to better understand the total number of hours chorusing per year, um, correlate that, which we've done, uh, we correlated that with yoy abundance per year. Then maybe think about um, South Carolina electrofishing data and the trammel net data to get an understanding how reproductive potential or spawning potential potential correlates with near-term reproductive success to medium-term year class strength to long-term year class strength. And so our final really next step is looking at 
long-term monitoring of estuarine soundscapes. So is there resilience or is there shifting baselines? So how does, you know, so we've, we've done a good job at, at defining baselines. So now what happens, you know, when we have noise pollution, nutrient changes, chemical pollution, invasive species, et cetera, how, that, how does that affect the soundscape? So for example, if we had recorders present in the 1800s and we compared it to the 2019, it'd probably be much different. So I like to think uh, a whole slew of people, Aga, a past lab manager who's done a lot of great work in soundscape ecology, uh, Alyssa Bradshaw, my past field uh, technician, um, Jim, um, graduate students from College of Charleston, Jamili, Caroline, and Lindsay, a whole slew of undergraduate students and interns, um, including some current employees at uh, Waddell Mariculture like Jake Morgenstern and Evan Bowman. And I really like to thank um, Anu Kappelman and, and Taylor, Taylor Morton, Ian Deary, um, SCDNR, um, Joey's, Joey's group helps us deploy recorders in Charleston Harbor and Winya Bay. So uh, really like to thank their group. Um, Spring Island, uh, Georgia Southern University um, for help, you mean, for helping uh, with a lot of our um, com computational science approach approaches, some of the folks at USC Baruch for uh, helping with the Winya Bay recorder. And of course, all of our funding sources over the last 10 years, including Port Royal Sound Foundation, Spring Island Trust, and very, very, very happy about um, our, 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 our collaboration with NOAA's Integrated Ocean Observing System and Socorro. So with that, I if there's any questions, um, I would be happy to answer. Okay, we're we got time for one question, and uh, it was: Have you recorded any sounds that you haven't been able to identify to date? Yes, lots of sounds. Um, one of the things we do once in a while get are sounds from manatees, um, and we actually do. We have a recording of a right whale in Charleston Harbor. I think that was just a long. Uh, pro due to propagation outside of Charleston as right whales migrate. Well, actually, we know those, but there is other fish species that we don't. We think we hear some river otters in the headwaters of the May um, because they make sound, but we're not really sure. It's So yeah, we do have a, a big catalog of unknown sounds, which is really neat. But we really are focusing more on the known pro sound producers and following them long term. Okay. Very good. Thank you very much, Eric.